Hey, Wood Turners. Hey, I'm Captain Eddie Castlewood. Welcome to my shop. Got a great little project for you today. We're going to rock and roll and get this one done. Normally, we visit here and we take square things and we make them round. It's a nice idea, but sometimes you kind of want to take square things and make them square. And you want to do it on that thing over there. Yeah. We're talking about a four sided vase. Yeah, or a four-sided box, or a four-sided jar, or a four-sided whatever, that is turned on a lathe, and it's four-sided. See how it goes? Okay, this is not a very difficult project, but I'm going to give you some warnings, and I want you to listen to all of them, and if you're uncomfortable at any time, stop. Put the brakes on. Otherwise, you know what you got to do next. You have to watch. To turn this piece I'm going to use two different blocks of wood. This is one I turned last night and I'm going to glue it onto a piece of waste wood so we can finish it out. You're just going to be imagining that you're looking at this on the smaller scale when that time comes. But for right now I've got a 4x4 four four about six and a half inches long. Okay? Now I have to lay it out in order to have my turning points. Let's go to the top of the piece. Top and bottom. You want an X. You want the dead center. Got it? Top and bottom. Then you find that center and you put a two inch circle. See that two inch circle? That's number one. Then you want to swing the arc that you're going to turn. Now we're working with it in the next pattern. I'll explain that this pattern could change and there will probably be, a, probably be a second video in this series to show you some variations on a theme. I have to find some wood to turn those variations, so for now we'll stick with this. I'm going to take and pick this spot where the circle crosses the line. That's going to be a point. I'm going to take a scratch all and locate those four points. See those four points located? All right. And then from the point, I'm going to take and swing a two inch radius. From the point, a two inch radius. From the point, two inch radius. See how that laid out? Okay, those are my cut lines. Now, you have that sketch in your mind? All right? Here, that's the other end. We're tapering it, okay? That's, you can do it both, same thing, top and bottom and just have a four-sided piece. If you want to stay simple, go there. I'm going to taper it. Smaller one, I've got a one and one half inch circle and then I swing inch and a half from there. So this piece is going to have a definite taper. The variation on the theme video is going to show you several other ways that you can take and twist this thing and make it into an art piece. Uh, but for right now, we're going to go with this four-sided, straight, slightly tapered. I said straight, slightly tapered. You got that? You got that. Okay. Now, I got to get over to the lathe. You know, we're going to use that machine. Hey, before I set this in the lathe and get started, I need to remind you about Big Eye Productions. At www.eddiecastellan.com, that's this address right here. At www.eddiecastellan.com, you will find the best deal on carbide cutters anywhere on this planet. I've also got sharpening devices, layout templates, and a whole lot of others. If you're into carbide cutting, you'll want to get into carbide cutting, you need to check my site. And if you're looking to buy carbide cutters and fisher tools, Measure the ones you have, and then check my cutters only page. I don't have them all, but I got a lot of them. My prices are the best around, and my carbide can't be beat. Now, to the lathe. To the lathe, to the lathe. All right. Now, I am going to turn this on between centers. Now, what do I mean between centers? Let's throw you in there. Do you see that? That's called the step center. That is a drive center with little points all around it and a spring-loaded tip. That's what is going to hold the piece as we drive it. Now, I'm going to take 
I always like to work small and big in. If you like to work the other way around, it's okay. I'm going to take this point right here. It's on top. And I'm going to take this one over here. It's on top. Now, the beauty of working like this is you can whoop, set your tool rest up, I mean your, uh, your headstock up one time. And I'm at those two points. It's critical that we're using the same two points, okay? Now, that is going to cause this piece to swing like this. Do you see that arc? That's that arc right there. That's what we're going to cut off. We're going to take this corner off. Now, I did this a couple of days ago for a Ustream video. And if you don't know about Ustream, Ustream TV is Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Saturday afternoons at 2 p.m. We do live turning. Just go to Ustream and look, search for making shavings. But you see, when I'd swing that, I'd have this thing way out of balance. So I'm going to show you a way to cheat into a little bit, and really, especially if you have a mini or a lightweight lathe. Okay, if you have a mini or a lightweight lathe, this is a much safer starting position. And what is this position? You gotta pardon me. I need to reach over and get all this done. This position is that. First thing I'm going to do is knock the corners off this piece. I'm going to reduce some of the waste wood that we're not going to need later. Now, you see that this corner, this whole corner right here, can you see it? Well, you're in a position where it's light because it's a beautiful day outside. You see this dead, this corner? This corner is dead to me. It's not going to be here at all. It doesn't matter. I have a smaller one on the other end. So what I'm going to do is take my roughing gouge and knock those corners off. Pretty simple, isn't it? Yep. Let's sharpen up first. Always sharpen up first. By using my Black Hawk rig and the basket that I use for roughing gouges, putting that gorgeous edge on there took one swing in front of the stone. One swing. I didn't leave a whole lot of this tool on the floor back there. One swing's all it took. Speed on the light to about 650 RPMs. I am between centers. Have it locked down. Roughing gouge. do is remove some of these big corners. Why? Well, because those big corners will tend to throw it off balance if it's a small leg. I don't want you to be scared of this when you turn it. If it's making your legs walk across the room like crazy, you're going to be scared of it. It's slowing up. Do you know why it's slowed up? Let me show you something. It's spinning on the headstock. The stub center, I jammed it enough to where the stub center came loose. I just tightened it up and go right back to it again. Now, I'm still a little ways away from this corner over here, about a half an inch, and I'm pretty good ways over here. So I can take a little bit more wood off. I can't encroach on my lines or I'll have to lay it out again. I've knocked the corners down a good bit. We're going to pick the speed up by about 200 RPMs. I'm, you're in a bad position to see it, but I'm rubbing a bevel right now. Because I'd rather slice wood than tear it away.
stop it so you can see it. And I'm not going to, no video cuts here. I want you to see something. Look how good those cuts are, and that's a roughing gouge because I was slicing wood, and I'm safe on my curve. See it? So, to actually start shaping the piece, now you don't have to knock those corners off, but you'll find out that it makes it feel a little bit better to you. To you, I'm going to go back to the first setup that I had, which is this quadrant top. And I put that scratch all indentation in there because I don't want it to read weak grain and move an eighth of an inch or whatever. So we're going to go right back into the piece again. Now, what I want you to see is the difference. I've moved the tailstock, the, the, the tool rest away. Look, you see what I'm talking about? It really spins a lot out of, out of round. That's part of how you're going to get the square cut, okay? I've now relocated the tool rest to something that's reasonable to start with. You can see I have about a quarter inch gap. I want to be taking a slicing cut with the roughing gouge. Now, speed is only at about 600 RPMs, and that's okay to start with. Why do I use this gouge? Because it's good and heavy and I don't get a lot of movement when I'm making a cut. If I bring the speed up to about maybe eight or nine hundred RPMs, I get a better cut. But for right now, see, a lot of vibration with that. Way too much. It'll get better as the size gets smaller. you can't tell right now is I am riding the bevel. And I'm cutting that shadow. Now, let me see, where am I at? You have to check this stuff. And that's the, the quadrant I'm cutting right now. And I'm about a quarter inch away from my goal on the other end. As you can see, I'm about a half an inch away from my goal on this end. So I need to work downhill and remove some more wood. I just did a major no-no. Did you catch it? I stuck my tool out there before my lathe came up to full speed. Take a look. I'm at my curve here. Up here I'm within about an eighth of an inch. So I want to show you something that you can see that I really can't very well. You see that line right there? That line is the shadow. That's how I'm determining if I'm straight or it, uh, uh, what my what my cutter is doing. I can't tell from what here. See? And I just reached goal. I've got, I can stop now, I can see i got a little rise here, I'm going to work that rise out, now I can adjust my tool rest a little bit, I'm going to work that rise out and then we're going to change positions.
change positions. Let's play a trick on balance. Right now, if we go around the clock, we would three times have something out of balance. Trust me, that's how it works. But I'm going to go to that position. Got to get my tool rest out the way. And the opposite is, I'm sorry, on the opposite end, I'm going to be on that one. Okay? Now, that is my next position for removing material. Now, I could sand this, I'm going to show you how to sand this out and make this look really good later on. But, for right now, we're just going to get some roughing done. Now, I've moved over to this position. I want you to do a 360 spin before you start. Okay? Because I want you to make sure it's clear of that tool rest and anything else that's out there. And don't forget to tighten up your tailstock when you go in. The vibration will back it off. That goes airborne. Okay? We crank it up and go for another shot. This is where it you're going to really worry about the vibration. You bring it up until you're comfortable. And remember, if you're ever uncomfortable, you stop. You see the line we're going for? You, you happen to be in the catbird seat. You see that line? That's our goal right there. That's the line that's... Boy, oh man, I wish I could be turning from that end. Here's the beauty. You know that shot you got? I can look at the at the uh, at the monitor and get really close to it. Man, that's nice. Just for Ron's sake, on Wednesday night, look. Ron said you couldn't do it with a skew. That's the only reason I did that. But if I do it with a skew, I need to raise the tool rest, lock it down, check my setting again. We're going to go back to it. now went to one of the other points and it's a company cross point okay and we're still at about the same speed let's see how the vibration is we're okay it's dancing a little bit I'm gonna go with an Ellsworth type gouge Not as smooth. There we are. All right. We're using the side. Still rubbing bevel. I'm just rubbing that part of the bevel. Yeah, we've got. Well, not quite. I see a little bit of line there. If we leave a little bit of line here and a little bit of line there, and all, we're going to end up a little bit of a problem. So, we're not going to leave the line. We're going to go ahead and knock it down a little bit the rest of the way. Um, you see? Just took a, a, another pass to get it down. Much better if we get rid of it. I'm worried about that one right there, but hey, I've got the spot. I can always go back and get it again. Flip it over to 
the last position, as you can see, I ran three out of four. Check up on this one. I haven't done this one. So the last position gets me there, and we will have a square piece. And tool rest didn't change because I'm the flip side of where I was a little while ago. I have all four quadrants turned. As you can see, we've got a square piece. That bothers me a little bit. It's just a little bit off, but like I said, I have the quadrants, I have the marks, I didn't get rid of them. Whoop. I'm going backwards, so I should load the spring loaded step center first and bring the other up. And you see, now, I still have the references. I can go back and take a sixteenth off and straighten that up and that would be in good shape. Up to full speed before I stick the tool in. My best guess, I got it. I nailed it. Let's talk about sanding it down and getting it in shape. Now, you can just take something like an 80 grit pad and go along the grain and you'll clean it up and it'll look nice. You can cheat a little bit. I'll bring the speed to, well, there we are, right there, 600. This is an 80 grit 12 by 12. You'll have to do that on all four quadrants to get them down. The other way is to take it out of the lathe, go to your belt sander, and run it down your belt sander flat, and that'll shape them up. Just don't round off the corners and get rid of them. Okay? In fact, that's what I'm going to do right now. No, not round off the corners. I'm going to take it to the belt sander. But you can't go there, so I'll be back in a minute. I took it out to the belt sander using a 120 grit pad and I got some unevenness out of it and I really like what I'm looking at now. I would put it back in a lathe. Yeah, kind of like this is the machine that it was created on. So this is the machine that will be finished on. And I'll get this right one day of going to the step center first. Because you can pull a load on it and get the other up. Then, I would take a my sander, and this is a powered sander, and I would buff it out all the way to 320, just like this. While it's just, you can set the, the, the tail, the, the lock, and sand it so you don't red round off those ridges. It's not a speed event now; it's a finishing event. So, if you're uncomfortable with that. Have any hard paper up right now? Okay, you can just take a pad okay, and knock the corners off, and it'll really knock the corners off, knock, knock it down, lay it out, put a good finish on it, get a good basic start on a finish, and then splash some seal on it before we take it to the next step. What's the next step? Oh, right now we got some square block of wood. Or sort of square block of wood. We gotta make something out of it. That's the next step. We have a block that we've sanded and we're ready to do something with. What are we gonna do with it? Well, we're gonna hollow it. To hollow it, I need to hold it. To hold it, I need to have something on it. My first inclination, and I would normally do, is stick this thing onto a glue block. Just flatten out this end, like I've done here, um, and then 
stick a glue block on it and then flip it around and turn it. But some rookie turners aren't very good at glue blocks and I don't want to get you hurt. And I don't want you to waste the project. So I'm going to crank the speed up. I'm between centers. Bring the speed up because I'm going to be hitting on a four-sided piece. I'm going to take my skew. And I'm going to put a foot on it. A tenon. What size? Right here. This is my tenon gauge. It's magnetic and it sticks to every freaking thing. But it's my tenon gauge. It will let me know the perfect size of the tenon to fit in my one-way stronghold chuck. And I can't make these gauges for you. You need to make them. I have some videos on it. They're very simple to do. I'll explain it when I get the, the chuck up here. I use my skew because I like that little dovetail thing. Now, we're going to flip it around. That's a close-up of the jaws, my number two profile jaws for a one-way stronghold chuck. When they're completely closed, that is a very true circle. See it? Very true. Alright, now, if I want to clamp down on something to get 100% surface adhesion or contact, it would be that size. But that's not very practical. So I'm going to open it up to be a little bit four-sided, alright? That's the size of this gauge. Do you see the, what I'm talking about? It's magnetic and it's going to stick like I told you everywhere. But that's the size of that gauge. Now, the other one is when I open up inside of something, I want to have as much contact as I can. So that's the size of that part of the gauge is the outside dimension. So when I crank it down, that's the smallest dimension that that jaw will fit into. So I want the, if I'm putting it in a socket, I want it to be slightly larger than this. If I'm grabbing a tenon, I want it to be slightly larger than this. So, and that's what I have here. I have it a slightly larger than that dimension. See it? Okay. When I stick it in and start to tighten it up, when it gets tight, I'm going to have a little bit of a crack here. I'm going to have real good surface adhesion all the way around, or friction, which is what I'm looking for. So that's how you make your gauge. And I brought the tail stock up to make sure I'm running true to center before I tighten it up too much. And then we snug it, roll it over, snug it again. My daddy told me that's why they got more than one hole in that chuck is to snug it that way. Now we're ready between centers. We have put it in the chuck, brought up the tail stock to center it. I want to hollow this thing somewhat to make a jar out of it. That's what we're going to start on. What's my first move? My first move is to move my tailstock out the way and get that pointy thing that'll go in your elbow out of the way. Don't need it. Get hurt by it. Then I'm going to drill a hole down the center and I do that every time I hollow for a couple of reasons. Number one, it gives me an idea of the actual depth that I'm going to hollow. It gives me a starting point, something I can work from. It gives me a bottom, something I can work to. And it keeps me from doing a flip over and jamming my tools. I have a 3 8 inch drill bit and a homemade handheld drill. That's a handle, a piece of pipe, a 3 8 24 fine thread bolt, a keyless chuck from the hardware store, and a bit. Speed of lathe is going to be about 600 RPMs. Not too fast. I'm going to find that center. And I'm going to start pushing it in. 
then I'm going to get my tailstock out the way. I'm using just the twist drill and just my pressure, not a drill chuck in the headstock. And I'm just going to go in. I'm going to do this full full depth because that I, that's about as deep as I'll be able to hollow this piece. To hollow this or core it out, I'm going to use the blue two. This is a new combo I introduced a couple of weeks ago. It is a 3 8 inch bar with a 10.7 millimeter radius square. The combination comes with the blue one, one bar, two radius square, two square. Blue two comes with two bars, two square, two radius square. The 12 millimeter color also fits on this and can be used for this. We're just going to run it down through the center here. And we work to that 3 8 inch hole, and that makes it a lot easier to remove the center. scraping cut coming out on the inside of that. I would sand it out a little bit and make it a finished piece and that just be by rolling up some of this um, I get it from Vince it's this foam backed sanding pad and I could pick one out that uh, I can start in at maybe uh, 120 or whatever and bring the speed to about five or six hundred RPMs and then Stand the interior out. Take it all the way to 320, part of the piece. Don't cut any corners on it. Alright, now we sand it all the way out. Now, this is not a presentable edge right now. Uh, this is our original layout edge. We need to clean that up. For this, we'd bring the speed way up. And I'm at about 1500 RPMs. And I take my fingernail gouge read that bevel back up and then easily go across. A good sharp tool, you won't have any problem reading that out and making that a slice all the way across how nice and clean that is. I got a little bit of push in here but that'll sand a little bit and I got very little push on the outside. Push is where the material moves a little bit different than what I was looking for. Again the speed would go down to about 600 RPM and I would just lap that out a little bit and go, go flat. This is going to give me a real good looking top edge. Now this is an accent point for the piece. You have to understand if this doesn't look good the whole piece won't look good. So those little tears I need to recut and get rid of those little tears. That's in cross grain. You see that. I could sand the heck out of it and it'd still be there just sand it. So we crank the speed back up again and we go across with another cut. And you can read the bevel back up look, look, look what comes off it is end grain, it's, it's going to curl like that but that cleaned up, well it's still got a little air alright, we're getting closer that's kind of an iffy spot, but I don't give up on it 
you push it too hard, you'll break it off. By the way, back cutting, that won't help anything. There we, we have it cleaned up now. Pay attention to your speed when you sand. You don't want to sand too fast. You'll burn it, clog up paper, and just waste time. Now, that's what I'm talking about, Bubba. That is a good presentation top. Leave that corner very sharp. You don't want to fix that corner or sand on that corner because if you do, you'll lose the detail. And the detail is crispness. Crisp. Yes. Now because I advocate doing things several different ways, remember it's not my way or the highway, it's the best way to work. This is a regular round nose scraper with a burnish on the end of it. Now, I want to clean up that edge and make it crisp. Watch. Oh, I'm going to get you in a better position. Alright. Stand by for the ride. I didn't want to shut it down. There you go. Now watch what comes off. That's cleaned up. But you see when I got afraid of hearing that vibration, I had that little thing right there. That was just outside of my comfort zone just a moment ago, but it doesn't mean I won't crank it up and go back and get it again. It's gone. It's gone pecan. It's looking good. Ready to sand out, clean up, and be done with. No! We still got it in a chuck. We got to do something about that. I mean, look. That ain't a finished piece. But that's easy. We're going to take the bottom off, get ready to jam chuck it. See that? Hey, girl. That's my big, brave, 110-pound black lab who is afraid of thunder, garbage trucks, and car doors. We have a pair of them. Well, they're not really a pair, they're about five years apart in age. But we have two of them, very, very shy. The real ferocious one around here is my 12 pound skip, my supposed to be 12 pound skipper keel weighs 25 pounds. That's the killer. Now, I'm gonna use my calibrated measuring device. That's it right here. I'm going to say that is the bottom, and you always measure twice and cut once. That's what Norm says, all right? That's my bottom. I want about a 3 8 inch bottom in it, so I'm going to move that down a little bit. And that's going to be my, I'm cutting it off there line. To hold this between centers when I'm working on it, because I don't want it to wobble away and get torn up, I'm going to bring up my tailstock. You see this revolving cone as part of the one-way revolving center. You get this cone and you get a small cone. And this cone is perfect for centering up larger pieces like jars and all that. And that puts me between centers. Between centers is a great place to be because it's extremely stable. It allows you to remove a lot of vibration from the piece. Um, and you have control over what's happening. I'm going to get my D-Way tools, parting tool. I can see the line very clearly, as you can right now. And I'm going to cut on that side of it. Now, why did I cut on that side? Because I anticipated some blowback a little bit when I did cut, some tearing. So I've got a quarter inch I'll have to take off when I have it in a jam chuck. That's not a big deal. I'd rather have a little more to take off than have to redo it. Now my 
our biggest mistake here would be to cut this completely off. I'm between centers. If I don't jam it, I can take it to about a quarter inch. Okay? I've got three-eighths of an inch of material I don't need that I'm going to remove. You see, let me talk to you about this. To cut that off is what I would call a hero move. And that would be to part it off holding it and all that. That's what these guys that do demonstrations at symposiums and all that stuff do to make you go, ooh, wow. You see, but when you go home and you do that hero move and you break the piece, you go, ooh, ah, and then you add some real big ugly words to it. So, I don't really like the hero moves. Don't like them. What I'd rather say is, I got that down to a quarter inch, and when I cracked it, that didn't fracture deeper than the three-eighths I'm taking off. It didn't. So, I now have something I could jam chuck, and I might have enough wood here to do just that. Or, I can just get another glue block up, another block, put it in there and shape it, and then I have a jam chuck. But I'm going to knock some corners off this and make one out of this. Okay? Stand by. Using that block I had, I just knocked the corners off with my skew. Because it's my double-sided flat scrape. Alright. Now, I need to get rid of this. This is just a pain. I could sand it off with the uh, the the sander, but most of the time this is all I would do. Okay, just so I don't have that bump there. I'm going to push it onto my glue block. Then I'm going to bring my tailstock up. You know that cone I had a little while ago? Well, I got something called the soft touch right here. This is, yeah, I got a box full of them. This is a block of wood that's been drilled and tapped. And see the tap? That's a three-quarter ten hardware store tap. You can get this at Ace Hardware Store, three-quarter ten. It fits on the end of that uh, revolving center. It's called a soft touch. Now I can bring this up, make contact, and line up my piece using that soft touch. And I will have the piece pushed onto a jam block and, and running fairly true. Now, why did I do the soft touch? Well, you got to be in the right spot to see that. So, let's move you. Now, maybe this can help. Tail stock, revolving center, soft touch. See the soft touch? I put the lines in there so you can see when it's moving. And I'm pushing up against the piece, and I have my tail stock locked. What this gave me, or gives me, is something I can work from that I don't have to be afraid of dulling my tools. You see, I'm going to push a gouge in here and clean up this bottom. And if I touch my steady, my revolving center, I'll dull my tool. So, I will not touch my revolving center. I will get back here and take it off. And if I make contact, it's wood. Now, I want you to pay attention to something, please if you would. That's my goal point. Now, I'm in pretty good shape with the bottom, but watch when I start this cut. I go almost vertical with the flute of this tool until I read that piece. Then I twist the tool open to get a cut. See it? I 
keep twisting it open. So the thing stop, see that? I made contact with the steady rest, but it's giving me enough pressure in the center where I can clean this piece up. That is a good clean cut on the bottom. No runs, hits, errors, nothing else. I'm going to pull this away and see if I can true this up just by removing that gently. Or, here's the or. Or I can pick up a detail tool. Mm, I think I have one in here. Yeah, this might be one. And I'm just going to take some of this away. I showed you how to make this tool a couple of weeks ago. in the video. It's very simple. It's just a piece of quarter inch rod. This really isn't sharp enough. I'm going to touch it up a little bit and then go. Alright, took about one quarter of a pass on this grinder. See to clean that up. Now you're going to say that doesn't cut very well. I'm not applying a lot of pressure and I'm not looking for a real heavy cut. I'm doing a little scraping. Now because I like to sign my name in a ring, I'm going to go ahead and put the ring on it right now. Alright, that would be part of my signature move. And then I'm going to take this off. Now if I jam it, it's going to come off the glue block, the jam block. So we're going to get to a point and we're going to say, you know what, that's pretty much as far as I'm going to go. Amazing. Just took it right out the way. Now, without making any moves or changes, I'm going to crank it back up and take my fingernail gouge and slice that up right easy. This is not a hero move. This is cap You're capable of this every single day of the week. All slices. All the time, all the way to the center. That, I, I like that. You really have to like what we got done here without a whole lot of jigging up, bringing up, and extra equipment, we did a four-sided box out of a piece of standard stock. Okay, Four-sided. Ventilated everything. Now, what would I do with this? I, number one, I'd sit down with a pad and rub out any imperfections I may have Get rid of the pencil marks. You'd be surprised how many times that stays in the finish. And then I turn myself a nice black or dark bronze or ironwood lid that will fit in there and just about go to the outside quadrant. Just about. Because you still want it. Here's the deal. You want it round because you want to show off the difference between the square and the round. Yeah. And you want them wondering how this happened on your lathe. Nice finish on the bottom, huh? Overall, I'm really happy with how this came out. Now, I'm going to do a sequel to this. Um, I really think Kevin Costner is going to fill in for me. I, I, I'm trying to make those arrangements. But I'm going to do a sequel. And a sequel because there's so many variations on this that you can do so many variations and so much fun you can have 
with it and don't get locked in on four sides in the sequel we'll play with a whole bunch of other numbers some prime not so prime all right well you've made something not really round on a machine that makes things round and it was all while you were in here today with me making shavings I'm Captain Eddie you be good take care see you soon you know what this would be great for this would be great temporary repository or depository for you to store your freedom pens when you turn pens. You turn pens for the troops and you need to have them someplace before you pack them up and ship them off to Joe Kelly. To, oh, you might not know about that. Here's the deal. <clears throat> you, a regular American, not really special, just a regular, true-blooded, red-blooded, honest-to-God American, can turn pens for our troops. They have to understand that the Democrats, the Republicans, the Independents, the Whigs, the Dignity, none of those people are really interested in this. It's you and I, the regular Americans. We're interested in turning pens for freedom pens. That's right. Over 170,000 pens have been turned by people like you and me. Well, people like me, but you know, not a whole lot of people like you. Not about that, okay? But if you want to be part of Freedom Pens, Team Blackhawk, drop me an email at this address right here. EddieCastleandCox.net. Include your phone number, and I will have Sarge Joe Kelly tell you how you can become part of Team Blackhawk and be turning for Freedom Pens. As an American, I think it's your obligation. Really do. You might have missed that one, but, you know, when you signed up, yep, that was part of it. All right, see you soon. Email me. It's amazing how many things you volunteered for that you don't remember. That'll teach you to have so much fun when you were young. I do like this piece. I really do.